male leader in homeland and national security, a frequent on-air national security analyst for CNN. She also serves as the faculty director of the Homeland Security Project at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, where she is also the Robert and Renee Belfer Lecturer in International Security. Previously, KM served as President Obama's Assistant Secretary for Intergovernmental Affairs at the Department of Homeland Security. She played a pivotal role in major operations, including the handling of the BP oil spill response. She also organized major policy efforts in immigration reform and community resilience. And before that, she was Massachusetts Governor Deval Patrick's Homeland Security Advisor, guiding regional planning and overseeing the National Guard. She is a recipient of many government honors, including the Distinguished Public Service Award, the Coast Guard's Highest Medal Award, Ms. Kayyem also uses her decades of experiences in both public and private sector risk management and preparedness and resiliency planning to provide strategic consulting to Fortune 500 companies and startups in technology, risk management, and cybersecurity. Ms. Kayyem's memoir, Security Mom, my Life Protecting the Home and the Homeland tells stories of her professional life in homeland security and her personal life as a mother. In 2013, she was named the Pulitzer Prize finalist for editorial columns in the Boston Globe, focusing on the ending of the Pentagon's combat exclusion rule against women, a policy that was changed that year. A graduate of Harvard College and Harvard Law School, She's the mother of three children and married to First Circuit, Circuit Court of Appeals Judge David Bannon. And now we are delighted to welcome you. Friends and friends of friends, and if you guys have my phone number, you'd be like, we're, we're going to Europe 
trip this summer? Or should we go? You know, like all that stuff that people worry about as parents, right? Should I do this or that? Or should I go there? Or is this okay to do? Right? This sort of barometer. It's not a. It's a helpful tool in a world of mayhem, but maybe not as helpful as being able to like you know fix a refrigerator or a car or something. But it's you know people are glad I'm in the family. Um, and so the the impetus for sort of trying to deconstruct this world came from an email from my cousin Karen. Um, I come, uh, uh, some of you may know my background, I come from a large Lebanese American family. My mom has nine brothers and sisters. I have 28 first cousins. I don't know half of their spouses. You know, I don't know their spouses' names. We wear name tags at family reunions. It's huge. Uh, and Karen, though, is one of my cousins, first cousins I'm very close to. And uh, for some reason, the Lebanese diaspora in California, where I grew up, um, all decided to become dentists. Did. So I have more than enough dental advice uh, that is necessary for someone like me. They actually, they say, they, when they see me on TV, they say nothing about the content of what I'm saying, but how my teeth look, which I guess is helpful. Um, so uh, uh, I get an email from Karen, whose daughter at the time was about 20 and at Penn University and wanted to go to New York for a 9-11 anniversary. Uh, I'm sorry, wanted to go to New York for a weekend that fell on a 9-11 anniversary or maybe the 13th or 14th. And she was concerned because there was some rumbling, as there often is, that this would be a perfect day for someone, anyone, right? Not the modern, obviously, but anyone to plan an attack or just to sort of disrupt our sense of stability. And so she writes me an email uh, that became a way of thinking about um, how to explain this world of mayhem. And it says, the subject line is Bin Laden. And it says, uh, 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 Dear Juliet, um, I uh, uh, hope you're well, goes through all that stuff, and says, um, Debbie, her daughter, wants to go to New York for the weekend, uh, but I've heard some rumblings of a potential attack. I told her not to go. She says I am crazy. I said I would call you. <laughs> yeah. um, do you think she should go? And then the most important, would you send you? I'm not going to send my kids, they were too young at the time. Uh, uh, by the way, how are your teeth? <laughs> are you wearing your night guard? <laughs> Let me know. Uh, uh, are you wearing your night guard? Let me know, and don't forget to tell me about the mom. <laughs> right, so this is, right, never before has dental care and uh, terrorism been so closely aligned, uh, but I got her point, which is just bringing it down to earth. I, every day there's just something crazy going on. And if it's not terrorism, it's a hurricane or an oil spill or an Ebola or ISIS or uh, whatever. Right? It is something, cyber attack, it is something. Bring it down to earth. Essentially what Karen was saying is, can you talk to me as I was talking, uh, as I talked to you about your dental care, right? Just bring it home. And that's actually what I tried to do since my post-government career, actually quite critical of myself and my field for not treating the homeland as a, as, a, as a group of citizens who are invested in their own safety and security. We made it too unknowable, too scary, too um, uh, unable to grasp. And so my post-government career has been, through a variety of different uh, 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 roles, a way to try to uh, bring it down to earth. So today, and so there are speeches that I can give that can absolutely terrify you, and I'm happy to do that in the question and answer period. Um, uh, but what I would like to do instead, of to do instead today is to actually have you think about and learn something about uh, uh, a word that we use a lot in, in uh, where we have so much mayhem, and that's the word resiliency. What does that mean for a society that is always going to have a certain level of vulnerability? And I say that with that last part, with happiness, not with there's a failure. Right? The obligation of a safety and security apparatus is to actually minimize the risk, maximize the defenses. That's right, so you try to make bad things not be bad. You try to protect yourself in anticipation that bad thing is happening. But the third piece that we often forget is maintain who we are as a society, as a community, as a family. Um, and that maintaining who we are is going to be inevitably vulnerable. 
there's no society like ours, 350 million plus people, or the, the flow of uh, people and goods and ideas across borders, the students and the immigrants and the um, and the accessibility, the desire to you know go into Boston to see a play, that movement, that's what we are about. And it's that ability to secure that movement, which is the obligation of government, but to also remind you that that movement is inherently vulnerable. You want to know how to, how to have a perfectly safe marathon? The question I was asked often after the Boston Marathon attacks, I know the answer. You don't have it. Right? And so that's the way to think about who we are as a site. It's not to give the government a pass, right? They owe it to us to minimize the risk and maximize the defenses. But to also remember that every day we're making calculations about how to maintain our own sense of who we are. And so I have a certain type of personality and, and realize that I'm a certain kind of mother, but I'll tell you the honest truth. So my friends and my husband call me a satellite mother, which is to compare with helicopter mothers. Um, and I sort of like, you know, I was like trying to get them on text and I didn't get cell service and I just shrugged, you know, whatever, they'll be fine. Um, but uh, they will be fine. Uh, but the truth is the satellite mom and the helicopter mom meet in the emergency room when the kid needs stitches, right? Either way, there's gonna be a certain level and I realized that trying to, um, but I realized that that was an acceptable thing to say, hard to say in government, right, that stuff happens. Um, but it's an acceptable thing to say because that's what you do every day of your life. And the part of what animates Security Mom in the book and, and all the work I do around it is to remind people that that level of vulnerability is what we accept in our own personal lives as well. You try to minimize the risk to your kids, you try to maximize the defenses, a helmet, a seatbelt, whatever else, but you can't keep them home their entire life, right? And you have to let them be free and experience the things that let them be the young adults and therefore the adults that then will contribute to the very society that is about the secure flow of people, goods, and ideas. That's the cycle. Um, and so this idea that can we stop all bad things from happening is a fool's errand. We tried to sell it to you, don't get me wrong. When I was in government and an analyst after 9-11, the never again mantra, we tried to sell it to you. But it was a fool's errand because there was no way in which we could guarantee it. Not only because the threat would change from the more formalized Al-Qaeda, right? Uh, where we focus on stopping, you know, for four years, we focused on stopping 19 guys from getting on four airplanes. That's what we did. That was the post 9-11 apparatus. But in 2005, what I call the course correction in Homeland it was a wake-up call that a nation that focused too much on stopping uh, 19 guys from getting on four airplanes could not keep an American city from drowning. Right? Over 1,000 people died during Hurricane Katrina. They did not die from the hurricane. They died from the neglect and the inability to be able to rescue a city that was essentially a flooded uh, uh, bathtub. And so when I say that in Homeland Security we saw a course correction in 2005, it is that we began to change uh, how we oriented our sense of risk. Once again, it is not to say that we shouldn't try to stop bad things from happening, but it was that terrorism and a specific type of terrorism were not going to be uh, all, we were not going to get the risk down to zero. So whether it was terrorism, which would change over time, certainly would change during the course of my time in the Obama administration from that more formalized Al Qaeda to the ISIS, you know, radicalized individual, I don't, you know, with, with tangential ties to ISIS, but is getting, you know, radicalized online to the hurricanes and the tornadoes and the oil spills and the cyber attacks and the Ebola and the H1N1 and, and school shootings, right? All of that um, would become what was the narrative of our homeland and our homeland security. And so people like me stopped thinking or stopped spending all of our time what we called left of boom, right? Think about you know, the prevention and the protection side and started to think maybe we can ju judge success as a society if we are prepared for when the boom happens, because I don't know what the boom is. It could be any of those things I just mentioned. But maybe we can measure success, not so much, not always, by what happens left of boom, by how, but how we, min, how we protect ourselves when the boom happens. And once again, that's what you do every single day. You are prepared in your head for if the thing goes wrong, if the accident happens, if the kid doesn't, can't be found, you have those contingency plans. And that's successful parenting, that's successful community building. It is true also for homeland security. 
So I began to think about this idea of resiliency, right? This idea that after, you know, yes, we'll do everything we can to stop the bad thing from happening, but maybe we can also begin to build more resilient societies. The problem is, now I'm going to do this. The problem is, I guess, is that, or I know, is that we tend to think of resiliency as a mood. This is Taylor Swift, is she moving? No, that's her Shake It Off song. Right, we tend to think of it as just like, oh, the bad thing happens, we have to be like the British and drink tea and stiff upper lip and do more yoga and we'd all be fine. Like, that's the, that's the notion of resiliency. Resiliency is actually not a mood. Um, it is much more than that. So for the um, remainder, or for the, the next part, I want to talk about to what are those investments in resiliency because you have to anticipate the boom. Right? I mean, in other words, we try to stop the school shootings, but you also have to know that's very hard to do in real time. And the vulnerabilities our students have are important. Or you try to stop climate change and mitigate what we're putting into the atmosphere, but in some places it's too late. Right? So what would you do to build more resilience? It's important to think about uh, what the word resiliency means. I love it and in the sense that when I finally looked it up, know Latin, don't make fun of my uh, pronunciation, but re is back, we would think that, obviously. But Cillian is jumping. Um, and that's interesting because it's not passive. It's not like I'm going to stand here, take what happens, and try to stay out. It's actually an affirmative investment. And I like to believe that that's been known for a very long time by some policymakers. Um, many of you know, and I just was asking the, the mantra, keep calm and carry on, which has sort of become a rallying cry for a more resilient society, or keep calm and marathon after the Boston Marathon, or keep calm and eat chocolate, or all those variations. Well, the eat, keep calm and carry on uh, slogan and poster, which I have, oh, sorry, let me go back along the other slide, this one, right, became this, you know, has become this sort of um, social, uh, you know, uh, visual, actually, in terms of where it shows up and its variations and, you know, everyone sort of thinks of it represents, of course, the Queen's Crown, sort of World War II, and how the British dealt with uh, what truly was an existential threat, right? The future of democracy and the rise of the, not the rise, the, 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 the winning of the Nazi regime. And uh, the keep calm and carry on mantra was believed for, ver for a very long time to have uh, been commissioned by the War Commission under Churchill as one of several slogans to uh, build a more resilient life, right? Because they were facing much more, to be honest, than, than most of us have ever faced in terms of uh, 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 the bombardment of, of London. And these slogans commissioned by Churchill uh, included ones that you'll also be familiar with, you know, loose lips and ships and others that sort of reminded the community and the public that they were part of uh, keep calm and carry on, though, actually did not appear at any time during wartime. It actually never was even known to have existed um, until later, or existed by modern, um, uh, modern folks, or us, in current affairs, until 2005. Uh, in 2005, a used book salesman in northern England was finally cleaning out his back room and found a couple boxes, of which this poster is there. And he loved it, he thought it was good, and he uh, uh, did a little research and realized that it had come from World War II um, and had been commissioned by Churchill. But it had never been released. Uh, Churchill actually, after commissioning a million of these posters, refused to let it be part of the public education, the civil, you know, the civil defense apparatus. And upon further review, it turns out that Churchill sort of pulled this campaign, this sort of just you know, be ready and be strong and be British because it was too passive. In other words, there's actually nothing calm about resiliency. It's actually an active affirmative effort. And his fear was that the sacrifices he was asking of the British, the men are going to war, the women are going to work, and they are sending their children to the countryside, did not reflect right, the kind of resiliency that he wanted. He needed them to jump. Right? Whether it was to fight or to work or to send their children away. And it's that idea right, of this activity, this jumping, that then I hope uh, will let you see that resiliency and building a resilient community and society.
society or seaport district or whatever we're building for, Boston Marathon, uh, requires us to not only look at left of boom, in other words, how do we stop the bad things from happening, but right of boom. And so in my extensive work in homeland and uh, uh, security and disaster management, or my husband likes to call me, he thinks my next book should be called My Disastrous Career, um, I thought I would uh, take um, uh, lessons I've learned um, in disaster management. So this is like, this is the main part, right? The, uh, disaster management about what, what was, what would help build a more resilient community and a home? Because I want you to think about how you might apply this to how you live and who you are and how you function and how you organize things. The first is that these systems that are more resilient, ones that are prepared for the booms, have redundancies in the system. I mean, in other words, they have backup plans. That can be expensive immediately, but uh, uh, admittedly, but often not as expensive than if you aren't prepared for the redundancy, right? Um, so you can think about this, we can legislate for redundancies in a resilient society by requiring hospitals as we do to have backup generators. But in this case, in this example, some of you, um, as was said in my bio, when things weren't going well with the oil uh, uh, pickup in, um, uh, during the BP oil spill, President Obama changed the leadership team. So I was brought in as the deputy uh, to the National Incident Command, the, the entity that was uh, dealing with the spill to try to get us back in order. Uh, so I know a lot about oil spills for some reason. And, uh, and so what happened during the BP oil spill was that the offshore drilling companies, including BP, but all the others as well, um, had convinced our Congress that they didn't need redundant safe, safety procedures. What would that redundancy have been? It doesn't mean you have a second of the moji. That's the apparatus that, that uh, brings up the oil. Um, uh, basically how oil works or how oil drilling works in my scientific way is imagine a vacuum cleaner and it's pulling up the pressure and it's pulling up, uh, which is essentially the oil or the dirt from underneath the ocean floor. And it's going up a pipe and then at the top of the seashore is this kind of boat um, or ship and it's collecting the oil um, and then sending it off, you know, in boats to, to various refineries. That's the scientific explanation. Just think of it as a vacuum cleaner. Um, and that this, actually, this, the, the, the uh, moji, it's called, that caught on fire is actually the vacuum bag. So uh, imagine you unplug that vacuum cleaner because the bag is broken and the vacuum cleaner doesn't go off. So that's what happened in the BP oil spill that the industry uh, had, a, had uh, that the technology had something called a blowout preventer. Some of you will remember this, that the blowout preventer is supposed to stop the pressure if something goes wrong with the ship, um, and there are no redundant blowout preventers. So when the blowout preventer went bad, we had no way to turn off the vacuum cleaner, and that is why the oil spill uh, lasted over 100 days, uh, a memorable summer for those of us who were working it. More in Importantly, the cost of a blowout preventer is about a quarter of a million dollars. At last count, BP has paid $42 billion in oil spill cleanup. But so you could think about systems that are prepared for the boom. How could, you, how could the industry convince us that nothing would ever go bad? This is a high risk thing, is offshore drilling. Uh, but it had, and therefore didn't have redundancies in the system, so that if one blow-up preventer goes out, okay, I anticipated the boom, it happened, I've got a redundancy in the system to protect myself. In real life, that can be expensive, uh, but as I said, it's often not as expensive as not having dealt with the potential of the boom. And I guess I should say, in real life, we do this every day, right? Chances are, you don't have just like one band-aid in your house. Much, right? I mean, in the sense that, of course, right? You're just going to want multiples of the thing that's going to help uh, if you have a work. The second thing that is, um, and this is a Boston Marathon, that is the attribute of a resilient system is uh, the capacity to pivot and be flexible. Whether it's terrorism, which is going to be a threat, or cyber security, or a pandemic. And Boston is actually my favorite example. Um, and I say this because I'm not in government, okay? 
Okay, so I was the State Homeland Security Advisor. I used to oversee for the state the, 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 um, uh, the Boston Marathon planning. I oversaw the National Guard. Um, and uh, I hate the term Boston Strong. Right? I get it. I get why it became part of our zeitgeist. But it makes it seem like we got through that because of our Irish stock, right? As if there weren't all sorts of investments in figuring out what would happen if there was literally a boom at the finish line. And that's what we trained for, and that's what we exercised for, and that's what we did across disciplines and across jurisdictions for months before every marathon. So that if the boom happened, you could pivot, in particular our public health apparatus, from dealing with exhaustion and blisters and dehydration to essentially triage. Right? And so why does that matter? Because while there was a tragedy, of three deaths at the finish line, of course, Officer Collier at, at the end of the week. Uh, 292 people went to area and out-of-state hospitals. Severely injured people, people who would have otherwise lost their lives. But for the activities of those at the finish line who were able to pivot, break rules sometimes, police officers are not allowed to put patients in the back of the car, of course they're gonna do that. And to, and to uh, minimize the deaths. So that's important. It's not luck, it's not strong, it's not a mood. That was actually investments in a public safety apparatus that was anticipating the boom, didn't know what it was gonna be. I remember the first phone calls I got was they thought it was a generator, they thought it, you know, until the second one, but that, that was able to pivot and save lives. Because a city that can, um, a city that faces 300 deaths, as compared to one that faces the tragedy of three, it's a very different narrative for that city, right? And it's the preparations rather than, as I said, the mood that actually made us strong. There's a second lesson that I want to say about the Boston Marathon, given just I've spent so much time on it now and now studying it and reviewing it. There was a second lesson that uh, that I think uh, led to our sense of resiliency that we would move on, that we would be better or, or, or strong as a city. Uh, uh, in every disaster I've ever worked, you know, Haiti, BP, earthquakes, whatever it is, there's one animating feature of, of anyone who is near the area. Family unification. How are my children? It's the only question people ask. You know, it's like, it goes, how are my children? You know, how's my dog? How's my husband? Like in that order, right? You know, it's like, it's, you know, but how are my children becomes the thing that animates. So what happened at the Boston Marathon also, right, in terms of this pivoting is, because no one knows what's going on, is at mile 26.1, very smart police officers started to move the runners over, those of you who know the Boston Marathon path, I know it too well, from Boylston, not to Newberry, it's too narrow, to Commonwealth, right? It's very wide. And they told the people at the end of the marathon, because those of you who know marathon planning, the family unification area tends to be around um, you know, your last name, so A through B, C through D, to move also to Commonwealth. And within about 40 minutes, they were, because there's 10,000 runners still out there, right? They were able to connect the families with the runners. Some of them had phones, but some of them did not. So that within two hours, Commonwealth Avenue was essentially cleared. There was, there was media there, but essentially cleared of, you know, people, right? In terms of what that sense of stress, like how are my kids, how's my family member, um, and able to then deal with the immediate issue at hand, which is, of course, that you had uh, deaths. So that idea that that investment in anticipation of the boom, right, becomes the thing that animates I have three teenagers, so it's like one of the 7.9 all the time. Um, so third, what, is, what do these features have? And think again about, and I should go back, right? Pivoting we do every day as well. Not that hard, I'm not gonna make it rocket science for you, right? You guys get this, right? And guys, right, that this pivoting. So third is um, fail-safe systems. This is not to mean to be a wonky word. It's essentially, do you have systems in place that stop uh, the cascading losses? Again, you're gonna assume the boom, that's the theme here, assume the boom, bad things will happen. Can you minimize how bad those things are? Because you're gonna stop them mid-track. 
And so you think about that all the time too in your personal life, right? If something bad happens, how do I make sure that the worst thing doesn't happen, right? How do I minimize these, what we call in my world, cascading losses? So this is my favorite example, not only because it involves Beyonce, but you guys will remember, you all will remember the Super Bowl at the Superdome Inn, ironically, uh, given where we started on this uh, New Orleans. Um, after Hurricane Katrina, they had to rebuild the city, and they had to rebuild the Superdome because of what happened. Uh, remember that the, the Superdome became, uh, for lots of really horrible reasons, an area that people sought shelter um, and was not prepared for it. Also because the Superdome was destroyed, it was not completely covered by that stage. So when architects rebuilt it and planners in disaster management helped to design it, uh, Mercedes now owns it, so I think it was a Mercedes who went on it, but uh, they, uh, they thought, wait, there will be more hurricanes, there will be more winds. They were to, to think that that was a once moment, if we assume that boom, right, how would you want to have built the Superdome this time? And so what they did is they uh, bifurcated the generator system. Um, so, and I mentioned Beyonce, she played, she played the halftime, she gets blamed for this, it was not her fault. We now know that she brought her own generator system. She performs, we're in the third quarter, the Patriots actually, I think, are behind, and uh, the lights go out. But the lights only go out in half of the yard. And that may be terrifying, let me tell you, it's not as terrifying as all lights going out. And so what happened is the way they built it was they're going to build a fail-safe system. We're going to cut off the cascading losses and protect the rest of the system. So think about that, whether it's terrorism or oil spills or nuclear, whatever, all the craziness that we talk about right now. Um, how would you stop the cascading losses? How do you, how do you think about that for your own home? Um, four. Why I'm so happy is because every day I assume the boom and then it doesn't happen, so I'm happy. Um, and honestly, you guys believe her being like, this is great. You know, actually, I want you to invest in your own resiliency because um, because we don't know what might happen next. Um, the fourth is uh, these systems have, a, remember, these are from all my disasters, uh, capacity to rapidly rebound. Um, I love Boston, and I do love the red line. Um, I don't quite get why we are surprised that snow happens every year. <laughs> and we built a modern, it's not modern, you look at the green line, you're like, this is sad. But if we built a, we're trying to build a modern city here, um, seemingly immune to the reality that snow will happen every year. Our system is not resilient. So three or four years ago, when we had those back-to-back -back, um, storms and blizzards, yeah. Okay, I get it. A blizzard is going to bring a system down. There's, that's a boom. And a second one will hurt it as well. And a third one will hurt it as well. Right? But shame on us for not having systems that get the system back up and running as soon as possible. You all accept systems go down. Your electricity goes down a couple hours, you get it. Maybe even a day if it's an ice storm. You know, five days, you, you know. Not, not acceptable in our modern I honestly mean that. Puerto Rico, not acceptable. Not acceptable, right? I can get Puerto Rico is going to go down. It's not a resilient system. But this idea that we don't have, we haven't built uh, uh, resiliency into at least, you know, Boston's transportation system uh, means that we haven't been learning from other cities. Look, other cities are in snow. Other cities have outside metropolitan transit systems, right? So that's, our system is not resilient, does not have the capacity to rapidly rebound, so that that winter that I just told you about, I guess it was four years ago now, right? Um, uh, it took 110 days to get the entire system back up and running. And that means all the sort of far lines and whatever. Into April, this is ridiculous, right? We are, this is us, right? And not to make us competitive with New York, but New York does it better. Why? Because they have actually assumed that more water will get into the system, that more wind will get into the system. They've assumed the boom, and they put into their transit system, despite all the problems they have, trust me, I read the newspaper, uh, capacity to rebound. So that after Hurricane uh, Sandy, a once, at that time, a once in a lifetime event for New York, the entire system was back up and running in four days. The entire system. 
So that's just, you, you've built for the assumption, and we, here in Boston we have it, for the assumption that that boom will happen. It's not a one-off event, right? Disasters are not random and rare anymore. We will get snow, Plum Island will get water, you know, whatever it is. Um, so we have to build for the capacity to get back and rebound, get the systems back up and running. Okay, and this is probably the most important one. So, yes, I've had a career of disasters. So, and that's, um, it's that we have to be really honest with ourselves. And part of the honesty that I tell you, that you know, as a nation, we're built unsafe. Like, dream on if we're gonna get the risk down to zero. Like, dream on. Um, let's better build to reduce the risk and prepare for uh, 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 what could happen. Um, is that means we have to be honest about the lessons learned from the, like, the previous disaster. So most resilient systems, the military does this, and communities are ones that take an honest look and pass on those lessons to the next generation, the next mayor, the next city planners, whoever it is, so that they can learn from the past. And that's really important because, as I said, these disasters, these events, whether it's an ISIS event, you know, they, they are not random and rare. They're going to recur in open societies like ours, and they're going to recur throughout the world because of you know, climate change, or uh, pandemics, that you know, these threats don't, aren't confined anymore. So what does a lessons learned apparatus look like? Well, sometimes it's quite formal. So one of the reasons why in this state, in every state in New England, a governor will call, will say because of a blizzard, no more uh, driving. It's not because the, you know, the state is, is being a nanny state. That's not, you know, if you, if you turn on sports radio, like always complain. I'm like, you know, really? These are the, it's because the lessons learned from the 1978 blizzard. Nearly 100 people died. Totally, and, and in my world, that people die is kind of known, right? In the sense that that's obviously the consequence of a disaster. How they die matters. The how they die matters because maybe if you can understand how they die, you can actually minimize the risk to them, whether the threat is guns or, 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 uh, or, an, or a car, you know, going through a, a, a city as it did this, this uh, week. So how they die matters. So when, we, when, when researchers went back to look at 1978, people did not die from the blizzard. People did not die from the hurricane. Not Most of them did not. Of those 90 plus or whatever, something like 87% died from carbon monoxide poisoning because they got into their cars and then their cars couldn't move and then they got cold and then they kept their cars on and then the exhaust pipe gets frozen over and they die. So when a governor or mayor says don't get into your car, it's not simply to relieve the public safety apparatus, it's because we know how people die in blizzards. That's how they die. And if you can make this one move and make you all sort of inconvenience for eight or 10 hours, whatever, right? You could have saved 100 lives. So that's sort of a rigorous lesson to learn. But I want to end on the less rigorous ones as well, because uh, the lessons we learn, the lessons some of you may have learned from wars past or from 9-11 or from serving more recently or disasters that you might have, uh, and crises you might have experienced, including, of course, the Boston Marathon personally, is that these lessons can also be passed on inform informally. While America suffered a tragedy on 9-11 and was the victim of a terrorist attack, just a few years later, almost a half a million people died in the tsunami. So just thinking about what that means for those communities as well. This is not, you know, this is something that's part of their history and narrative as well. Another 250,000 would die because they didn't have the public health apparatus to protect from disease. And if you asked me, because I didn't know much about tsunamis, what, how, who died? I would say if you were close to the water, you were dead. And if you were far away from the water, you were lucky. But when researchers went back to look at the shoreline, in particular of Thailand, um, they saw something different, which is a certain community here would be, you know, 98% survival rate, and right next to it, you know, 22% survival, and then next to that, 81%, and then there's a hotel, like 12% survival. So what's going on here? So it turns out there was a tsunami in 1912, and that tsunami taught a lesson to those who had survived it, and that lesson was taught generation orally uh, down the line, so that villages that were older survived in other words, that had been around a long time, and new immigrant 
uh, uh, villages, let alone people like you and me who may have been visiting Thailand at the time who would have no idea, uh, got wiped out. And that lesson was, when the waters recede, run for the hills. That's a lot, I would have known that, right? And, and you know, if I was in Thailand at the time and that was happening, you would think, this is so interesting, right? But when the water rushes back, run for the hills. And that lesson, right, now is well known by all of us, but has also been incorporated into planning there, right? So I got you through terrorism and snowstorms and, and blackouts and tsunamis and what else did we go over? We went through a lot, my God. Um, uh, to describe, uh, uh, to make all of you realize that these five lessons are ones that you're living every day as well. And the more that you can also build resiliency into your own system, um, then the less that the mayhem that you're hearing when I'm on CNN or WGBH or you're reading the news and you're worried about nuclear Armageddon or you're screaming at you know, whoever on, uh, um, uh, you know, on the screen, uh, that actually you own this. You own your capacity to be ready for that event. It's not the experts. We have an obligation. The government has an obligation. Uh, but also, as there's a lot that we can do, because none of these is that hard, um, to prepare ourselves. Because I cannot tell you what that boom is. And I'm happy to answer the questions, as I know a lot of you are focused on the headlines today. Um, I cannot tell you what the boom is, uh, but I can unfortunately promise you, it will happen. Right? So if you assume the boom um, uh, and prepare for it, uh, that is what builds a more resilient community for all of us and our children. So that's my lessons from a disastrous career. Um, and I am very grateful for your, oh, I am very grateful for your time. And I'm happy to take lots of questions because that's also the fun part. That's a great question because I was involved with this. So, um, uh, so there's, there's, so let me go through the physical aspects of what's going on on the border because I did border enforcement as Assistant Secretary of Department of Homeland Security is essentially a border agency. So you would know this from the campaign, and part of this is the politics of uh, 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 of Democrats not being strong enough on immigration enforcement as we often are. So President Obama built 800 miles of wall, and that's essentially what's there now. You don't build wall, we did assessments of this, you know, over water or on high mountains or in high density areas where uh, you may need to have the flow, right? In other words, because a million people move across the Mexican-American border a week, right? You're gonna have to have at least sort of secure flow at various points across. So there's, there was a rationality to where we built the wall. And my understanding from what, but, but just something to do physically, I'm the atmospherics of it, I'll talk about in a second. So what we're seeing now in terms of what the Department of Homeland Security is doing and what it's commissioned, although the president does not have the budgeting for this, is uh, probably amplifications to the walls that are already there. One of the reasons why that's true is, and now I'll get to the politics of it, not pro or against, is, is because immigration cuts in really weird ways in border states. Um, not a single Republican senator, nor, uh, more importantly, Republican you know, state senators, state reps, mayors, on the border right, is, is supportive of the wall. Right? In other words, because they see that it's all about this fluidity, whether it's the land or the property or the water or the animals or whatever it is. So it's a, it's a, it's complicated, but it's 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 complicated because of the tension between security and flow, and that's a tension that um, no other country experiences because of our big border. So it's different than say the Vatican or something like that, which doesn't need to secure flow for you know for anyone but visitors. Our economy depends on that. So what is, but the politics of it are obviously different. And so just, you know, with my sort of, you know, hat on in terms of immigration enforcement, I assume, honestly, I assume that there's a limited budget. And so if you ask me, where do you want to spend $20 billion, because I'm going to assume that the Mexicans aren't going to pay, 
in terms of immigration enforcement, I would not spend it on a wall. I would spend it on interior enforcement, and I would focus on criminals and others. For Democrats like myself, I'm a, I'm a public safety Democrat in my own party. There's not a lot of space for us sometimes, right? Because the party, you know, the party tends to be, you know, talk about bridges and not walls. It's a very hard thing to talk about, but I'm all for tough immigration enforcement. It's just a priority uh, one now that the wall, now that parts of the wall have been built. I'll tell an anecdote, and it's just, you know, it just tells you a little bit the politics of this. While Republicans are torn about the wall, right, in terms of where they live and what it is, and Democrats are torn about the wall, I was advising um, Hillary Clinton on Homeland Security issues. I wasn't a part of the campaign. She just brought together Democrats and Republicans. And uh, the wall came up because it was always a very appealing uh, thing for Trump. And I remember saying to her, why can't you say we built that damn wall, right? Because if you go to the border, it's there. You know, it's just not everywhere. And it's just, it, it politically is a challenge for the Democrats as well. So, I mean, I wish there was space in the party to be able to say, we're tough on immigration enforcement. So you've got funny dynamics in both. But operationally, it's not where I would focus my efforts. If you had all the money, though, would it work? Uh, it would work in some place. I mean, to, when you ask that question, so it will work against what? So what? here's what the impact will be. In the same way that I think like the Muslim ban, which was litigated today, it will work because it's over-inclusive, but what are you losing out on it? And, and so that's what you have to wait against. So here's what will happen. Uh, the flow of commerce, it's our second largest trading partner. We'd be impacted. Prices would be higher, produce would be higher because the delays would be greater. So wait against what? And, and so I tend to think about Homeland Security not just in terms of security. I call it, and you heard me say it once or twice, the secure flow of people, goods, and networks. Right? It has to be both, just given the society we're in. And that's how I think about it. So there will be places where you don't want flow, right? You don't like an airport. You don't want quick flow, and we all accept it as the price of, of, of it because, um, but a border that has a million people moving back, our second largest trading partner, um, that you can't, it's un I guess I would say it's unsustainable. It, it really, it would be economically, and you see the pressures the other way, just as you are in the trade debate. Oh, that's so, yes, I always forget to say that part. She should absolutely go. Uh, because stuff happens, right? And you give her the phone numbers. And I do a lot of, you know, advice, you know, you know, for parents who are nervous about kids and stuff and sort of how do you prepare them. And, and you know, one important thing that um, a lot of you will be familiar with is, you know, now with cell phones and stuff, it's a lot easier to accept, access your kid. But when you go to a new city or a new country, um, after the first night there, ask your kid if they know the name of where they're staying. And all of a sudden it dawned on me, like they're like, oh, the hotel, right? And you're like, no, it's not like there's lots of hotels, and especially with Airbnb, so things like that that you want to make sure that they actually are, are armed with their own information. Yes. So um, that's a great question. And no, I mean, I don't think we will, and I think that um, uh, I think it's just hard to tell what's going on right now um, uh, uh, because, um, let me just be clear, North Korea will not denuclearize. It's not going to get rid of its nuclear arms because it saw what happened in Libya and it sees what happens and, and it won't believe us in terms of our promise that we are not into regime change. So if that's the case, then the U.S. options are limited. Right, so one is you do a strike, which the military is advising against because the cons and South Korea is because the consequences are insane. You try to, you know, maintain and isolate him through the sanctions and getting China on board and Russia, which Russia is a huge culprit in this as well. Russia is the one, you know, you know, supplying all sorts of bad things to North Korea as well. But you try to to minimize the risk and you accept an unstable right leader but one that might be contained. And so what's happening now is, I think there's a mis, mis, um, misalignment between the expectations going into this meeting between Trump and um, Kim. The, the Trump administration is saying that they promised, or at least President Trump is, denuclearization. There's no way Kim has done, or no one thinks that he's done that. 
So I'm not sure that it's actually going to happen, um, given that you don't have a baseline. And in the interim, Kim has sort of elevated his role. But you know, it's it's a it's hard to imagine. We've contained scary threats for long periods of time, and unfortunately, with nuclear weapons, we better be good at it. Uh, but I just don't see a first strike as an option um, at this stage. And to say, you know, shock and awe does not work, right? I mean, the consequences have, are felt throughout. <coughs> yes? One of the uh, disasters that you mentioned was Stinshu. Yes. What is your opinion or a recommendation for preparedness? Yes. Exactly. Well, the preparedness, in, okay, so, um, I try not to be too political, but I'm going to be long right now. Um, and I'm going to look at the numbers. So I'm going to be quantitative. So what's killing our children? It's not ISIS. Right? It's just not ISIS. It's like, you know, if I actually just looked at the numbers. And I think, and I teach in Homeland Security, and it wasn't until this year that I started to teach about school shootings, because I think some of the success of the politics of how we think about guns is that we don't view it as a Homeland Security issue a risk to our homeland, we view it as a law enforcement issue. And so you saw a lot of people, including me when I was on air or writing or whatever, start to talk about guns as a homeland security issue, not because we don't, you know, uh, recognize that the Second Amendment, you know, affords certain rights, but because if you look at the numbers and you look at the means, they seem to be related, right? And I would never, for example, I would never propose a counterterrorism strategy that did not look at the means of death as a way of trying to minimize the risk, right? So, so airplanes are a perfect example. They were using airplanes, so let's focus on securing airplanes. We're not banning airplanes. We're letting airplanes go up in the air, but we have all sorts of security procedures both in before we get on. And so I've gotten much more focused on a, a certain kind of gun control, which would be the, you know, AKs and whatever, you know, um, as a part of a homeland security effort just because I'm looking at the vulnerabilities of our homeland and, and not just terrorists, but, well, terrorism on the, uh, terrorism from Islamic uh, terrorism, but also what we see in terrorism on the right. So I think it's very important that uh, we begin to address reasonable, 98% of this room agrees with me right now because I've seen the polling, reasonable gun reforms, but just, and my focus would be what weapons are killing our kids very quickly, right? Because a handgun, I get, whatever, you can stop it, but the, you know, the ones that kill our you know, kill 16 kids in six minutes, like, no need for that. On the preparedness side, um, I hear from parents, I'm in the Cambridge public school system, you know, every two, twice a year, they do the active shooter training, I get all the emails, everyone complaining, isn't it horrible, our kids have to do this, and I say, like, okay, first of all, no, it's not horrible. It's army, no pun intended. It's giving your kids the tools necessary and their parent and their teachers necessary should the boom happen. You, you're not going to get rid of the risk this stage. So I don't say cheer it, but I say don't fight it. Actually, get your kids engaged with it. Support the school because they're testing all sorts of things. They're testing notification protocols, which are really important. They're testing unification protocols because if you heard something was happening at one of your kids. Schools, you're running there immediately and all, and all issues like that. So I think it's really important that we do do those protocols and then of course have, you know, depending on the, the, the threat at the particular school, some schools will be uh, more vulnerable than others um, to, you know, I have no problems with armed guards. I would mandate it. I, the, the idea of armed te teachers, as I said, I'm in the Cambridge public school system, and teachers have names like King and Lenny and Wildflower. Like, it ain't happening. Like, they are not being armed. And let me tell you, they would not want to be armed. Like, you actually, you don't want them armed. Um, and so I think that there are things we can do on the protection side, but also we need to, we need to prepare ourselves until we, you know, because it's what we owe our kids. Um, I should say Columbine was a wake, you know, I said Hurricane Katrina was a wake-up call in 2005. Columbine was a wake-up call because the protocols for school shootings, if there were any, but the protocols for evacuations were um, um, stay put. So when you go back to Columbine, of course, most of the kids were told to stay put in the cafeteria. The, boy, the boys walk in, the murderers, I shouldn't have called them boys, that was too benign. The murderers walk in and that's where most of the fatalities happen. That's why your kids, our kids are being told to run. 
if they can. If, if you're in an urban school like ours, that's why they hunker down. But if you can run, I tell my kids at a movie theater, if you can run, run. Right, there's, there's like, you know, that's, run, that's our advice. Yeah. Um, so you talked about secure flow. Yeah. So, are you really? So, it, yeah. I think there are probably, probably would have been better ways to do it. So, I just, I, you know, maybe part of this is just going back in time. You know, to federalize the security of an entire system within a month is hard to do. So, the mistakes will be made. And then once you create that bureaucracy, it's hard to ratchet down. It's, it's I describe it in the book, it's, it's the ratchet up conundrum, right? Once you ratchet up, whether it's the National Guard in Massachusetts at Pilgrim Nuclear Facility, who were there until what year did they finally, what year did the emergency finally come down? Because no, no governor and no mayor wanted to say, this is kind of silly, 2009. The National Guard that was deployed immediately after 2001, so the ratchet down is hard. I think they're getting better um, in some uh, sectors. They obviously have huge issues. I think tech, I think this is where technology actually can help with the secure flow. We view technology as you know something that you know is, can be scary. It actually will benefit. And I think what you're going to see in airline travel, it took us 15 years to to realize this, is that there'll be two classes of travelers. This will be true of almost all travel. There'll be burdened travelers and unburdened travelers. There will be people who have the TSA pre-clear or whatever who get through and get through quickly. And you'll you even see at Logan, so many people are getting it that the orientation of the pre-clear lines now overwhelms the unpre-clear. And you look at them and you're like, you're the burning people, right? And I'm the unburdened people. So I think that's the way it's going to go because tech, you know, because if, if I if I book a flight tonight for Friday to DC, um, they know me, they know I take that flight, they know my credit card number, they know, you know, and I'm, I'm going through, right? So it's, and that's the way it should be. That should be the secure flow, so. But I agree with you that, you know, that there were things that were che would have been cheaper that would have done a, a, a lot of that, but airplanes just still have this, have still captured our counterterrorism apparatus, that if an air, something were happen on an airplane again. It's just, just like, that's like the one, when I say prepare for the boom, that's like the one thing that everything is on prevention. Yes? Yeah. Um, that's a great question. So, uh, so the protection of our country's electrical grid, which is a key critical infrastructure, that, uh, what's being done to protect our electrical grid? Um, okay, so I can do it shortly, which is not enough. And that's because, and so there's two types of threats to, to the grid. Um, so one is the natural disaster um, type of harm. You know, something uh, happens and, or, or, you know, a generator goes out, whatever, and so you have a sort of a not purposeful disruption. So our system is actually um, being built better now, in particular on fail-safe mechanisms. So that's why I tell you about that. In other words, it'd be very, un very unusual at this day and age to have the kind of blackouts that we saw like a decade ago, um, because it's really hard to bring the whole system down. There's enough fail-safe mechanisms and, and barriers. So I think someone probably could figure it out, but it would be hard to do. And so. Um, but things that are happening, like in Europe, um, the, the laws are not demanding it, and the market hasn't gotten there yet. And that would be things like putting wires underground, you know, or uh, sort of protecting the electrical grid uh, in ways that are done in other countries. So until we recognize, and I'm talking about climate change threats, until we recognize that we won't be resilient, until we actually mandate, you know, uh, uh, a different how we built the system, or the market mandates it because it becomes a uh, a, a consumer demand. Uh, you're not going to see significant changes now from cyber attacks. That this, that's the thing that actually makes a lot of us nervous because um, because that's not physical. So the, we you know it, it's the, it's the mix between the cyber. And it's, this is what the Internet of Things is, right? The vulnerability of the cyber attack actually having physical implications. 
So this is interesting, and I can't speak for every jurisdiction, but actually because of concerns about you know, a purposeful attack, I mean, you're, you're reading the newspapers now, we have pretty strong evidence about Russia, we have pretty strong evidence about um, uh, other countries trying to play around with our critical infrastructure. There's actually been more investments in protecting the network, certainly not enough, but in protecting uh, the network, in particular, ensuring that, in my world, what we call, that there's not a single point of failure. In other words, you just cannot build a cyber apparatus that one access point could bring the whole system down. Um, that's, that was the lesson learned, excuse me, from the Sony attack. The Sony, you know, that was actually North Korea, but, you know, the entire, here's a Japanese company, the entire company's secrets were exposed, leading to all sorts of consequences um, uh, from a single point of failure, and that was one system administrator's password. You just can't build a system like that. You just can't. It has to have various barriers, right? Because that person may not just may not be stupid. That person could also be a threat, right? So, but not enough. The market's not. The, the laws aren't demanding that the market's not receptive. It's a great. Another quick question: Are you a fan of the TV series Homeland? I am. I'm a season behind though, and I'm a fan of the Americans. Um, but I never watched Scandal, which I would like to see. So I got a lot of streaming. Um, uh, so um, you had a real question, which was a oh, great thing. So I want you to think. Uh, that was the better question, but I want you to think of the. Um, so I want you to think of what's happening now that some of the politics that you hear is sort of happening at this level, and yet at this operations level, and I've been out a while, but everything I hear from my colleagues is, it's relatively the same, that mandates have not changed, that Five Eyes and other intelligence, uh, the best exchange of, country, of five countries of our intelligence, is still pretty rigorous. It has not taken hits, despite some of the fighting that's going on on the political levels. So I think that that's, um, I, I, I'm pretty confident in that. Now, four years or eight years under strain because, you know, for example, our intelligence agencies are, are under, you know, are being criticized or, or not getting the resources they need. I don't know what that looks like over time. But if you said, well, the politics seem kind of different, that's my benign way of putting it now, I think operationally it's, it's a lot less so um, uh, different. That is pretty much the same. I think what has changed, or, and this was true as I was leaving government, we just started to see this wave, is that there's really just not that much good intelligence. It's not so much of what you're sharing it. You know, there's, you know, as I said, you know, no security apparatus. You, you could not have a security apparatus in a democracy. So remember my third point, you want to maintain who you are. That could stop every guy from getting online, being radicalized by some cleric or some ISIS video, finding easy access to weaponry, and finding a soft target, right? The same is true as if that guy is in the US and gets radicalized by hatred and gets easy access to guns and shoots up, you know, and, and, and white supremacy and shoots up a church, right? I mean, you know, in other words, it's that, that is a very difficult thing when someone's not leaving an imprint. And so sometimes some of these cases that you see where you know, the person was known to law enforcement but not known to be radicalized, especially in Europe, it isn't that they're not sharing the information, it's just that the information is really hard. And to think, you know, the radicalization process, people know a lot more than me, the way I describe it is, for a lot of these guys, they're not part of a network they almost all have in common through mental issues, hatred of women, there's just no question about that. You know, all of them have uh, some sort of you know, abuse or whatever uh, uh, in their lives. But you know, they are buying hate and ISIS is selling it. That's how I think of the transition. <laughs> and that's a hard thing to stop when it's happening online. your home. 
sense of um, protection and resiliency. Is it the deep state what keeps us protected in some way because it's all that underpinning that keeps on going no matter what, no matter what shenanigans yeah. are going at the top rather than being something horrible and nasty? Right, and it's just a, yeah. I mean, I can tell you, but I have to kill you. So <laughs> I'm not going to, I'll leave it at this level. But um, look, the deep state is a terminology to describe exactly what I was describing, this level. Right, intelligence agents, assets, people that are on the CIA payroll who are bad people but are giving us information about even worse people, all that stuff, the surveillance, the wiretapping, all that stuff has existed for, you know, well, this surveillance hasn't existed, has existed for a very long time. And we used to call it, you know, intelligence or intelligence gathering or covert actions. Something about this terminology, which is taking hold as a deep state, makes people you know, feel like it has a political under overtone. Do I think that there's, um, but that's not to say that that apparatus, I'll put it this way, should not be checked by something. And that doesn't always mean it has to be transparent. In other words, I'm, now that I'm out, I'm more than happy that I don't know everything. Because when I was in, I was really happy that you, you know, that, that the me that would come out wouldn't know what was going on. Not because it's infantilizing, but because it puts at risk the very thing they're trying to do, which is dismantle the threat. Right? If I told you every covert action, then you know they just delay the attack to the next thing. Right? So, so there's a role for that even in a democracy. And I think the way to think about some of these more extreme measures that can be worrisome for any one of us is to think about how, what kind of system of regulation would you want over them. So the FISA court, which a lot of people criticize or whatever, you know, people on the left criticize, people on the right criticize, whatever. So the FISA court is actually a, a way, that's a foreign intelligence surveillance court, the FISC, is a way to put some structure on an extraordinary power, which is the warrantless wiretapping of people here in the United States. That's, that's an extraordinary power. We have the Fourth Amendment. So what are the reasons that you would want to do that if you're the deep state? Okay, you better prove it to a court that's specialized in this and that may approve it or make you go back and prove more things. Or think about, so there's different kinds of checks that you can have. You can have for uh, a covert action that involves a death. Um, this was true under Obama, not true under Trump because he, he delegated that to the Defense Department. But for Obama, uh, uh, a drone strike that could result, all drone strikes were authorized by the president himself. And you could think of it, that as being a check, right? That you have political check on what is happening um, you know, on the ground. Or one other example is you know, if you have an extraordinary um, authority, like think about the detention authority and you wanted to expand it, you could set up a check on that authority, um, you know, whether it's surveillance or FISA is like, it's a foreign time of the Surveillance Act, that sunset it. In other words, okay, okay, government, okay, deep state, we'll give you this authority, but you only get it for 30 days. And after 30 days, because it's so extraordinary and because it doesn't fit neatly into our idea of how democracies work, you better prove to me that you need to extend the wiretap or it falters. So, so this is the interesting thing about what's happening in you know, the biggest case in America right now, the Mueller investigation, is that um, it wasn't simply that there were FISA warrants that were authorized by the court, but they kept getting reauthorized. So people like me think that it, there's something there. Like I, I can't tell you honestly what it is, but you wouldn't get it reauthorized because the, the warrant would have, the, the wiretap hat is sunset. So just, you know, thinking about it that way. So we do checks on it. Yes. So I was like trans. Okay. And um one of the things I was talking about was uh just like on um the past. And now um I was talking about the beginning of the class and the same problem and then I was still trying to figure out sure. So my question to you is how citizens find out how the city of town Yeah. So um, some of that will be public. So this is where it's a great question because 
a lot has changed in terms of disclosures over the last 18 months, especially on environmental disclosures as your stuff on the train and what's being transported. But actually, that should be public at this stage. I mean, in other words, if you're, depending on uh, who the train owner is, right, and what, what the line is, that should be actually relatively accessible through actually the state, you know, um, DPU, it would, be, it would be the state. We know every, when I was saying, you know everything that's coming through on these lines. Yeah. Yes, last question, I guess, or, oh yeah. Are we uh, prepared for the November elections? No. It's <laughs> a great question, no. Um, so, okay, so I have strong opinions about this. Um, so, okay, here they go. So the first is, um, I worry less about vote changes. Uh, I think it can happen, and you know, and, it's, and we're not immune to it, but I think um, one of the benefits of what happened in 2016 is actually it woke up uh, secretaries of states and others to begin to think seriously about, you know, how is information being transported? Are we really using word perfect and emails to, you know, send over whatever? So I think there is more rigorous assessments sort of protecting that vote. Did you vote for X and it's saying Y? Also, um, it, um, uh, uh, our election, you know, we have only 50 states and what, we have like 3,700 electoral system, election systems in this country. Only this country can manage to do that, right? So, but that's good because it, you know, if, if you infiltrate one, there's 3,000 more. So the, the, and this is what Obama thought, you know, he says is that the, the lack of cohesiveness, the, our federal system actually was protecting us because the lack of cohesiveness was a was a was essentially a redundancy. Um, what so so I think more is being done, and so if you actually look, there's great activity being done in, on the on the lower level, not the political level, on the lower level in terms of preparing states uh, for for what could happen. What we haven't done is to uh, I would say less about the voting and more about democracy. I think we just have not, the, you, you cannot, it's hard to say what specifically the United States has done since the 2016 election to make the price of Putin doing it again in 2018 um, higher. I mean, naming and shaming doesn't work, you know, all, you know, and so you have to, we have to be prepared in terms of, you know, what are they doing? Are we exposing it in real time? Or do we have a unified nonpartisan effort to stop it from happening, to expose it when it's happening? Are we putting resources? Uh, are we suing people? Are we locking people up? Are we doing the sanctions that are necessary? All that stuff that has to be done because, you know, we know he hasn't stopped, right, in other Western countries. We've, I would say the one benefit we've gotten, they've gotten a little bit better, so we have learned from it. And, you know, don't get me started about Facebook and other companies, because the third piece is, of course, it's not just the government's responsibility. I, Facebook. So Facebook convinced all of you, including me, although I don't do Facebook personally, that what Facebook was, which is we get to see cats and our nieces and nephews and you know whoever you know whatever and funny videos of people you know water skiing I don't know you know whatever it is is they convince us that what they do is how they make money and how they make money is they're selling and they'll 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 get you they get mad when people say oh we don't sell it right but they're selling you. And, um, and they are selling you to any buyer. Um, but they're not just a platform. They're a, they're a publication. They are, and so is that acceptable? Um, I don't know if Facebook, I mean, I think, you know, I don't know if there's gonna be legislation or whatever else, you know, lots has happened since that testimony, but until we realize that they are not a platform, they are, that they publish, right? And, uh, and that they're selling you um, and put regulations around that, it's going to be hard to stop. Is that it? I think that's it. Thank you.
came in, they were looking. 